All right, internet, welcome back. So it's uh, it's been a little while since I've put out a video, partly due to the fact that I needed to figure out what I wanted to do next, and then also due to the fact that this next thing that I did uh, took a very long time. So this video is around how to fail at setting up Elk. Uh, I'll spoil the end for you that I, I succeeded in setting it up, but the reason I wanted to create this video and kind of present my journey to setting up Elk um, is due to the fact that when you do a lot of searches for tutorials on Elk, you tend to find a lot of people saying the same stuff. They're teaching you how to set up Elk, um, the basic steps of like getting your first instance set up and reading uh, maybe some data off of your machine, maybe like Windows, uh, Sysmon logs or something else. But a lot of those tutorials, they tend to cut corners and they tend to be very uh, very quick and not very thoroughly uh, discussed. And they don't talk a lot about the failures that they had as individuals and also common failures amongst many people that do this for the first time. At least people that have not set up a sim historically, like myself. So um, what I wanted to do is basically walk you through my failure story, um, talk you through some of the common occurrences, or not occurrences, but common basically um, screw ups that I came into and, I, and I've seen other people do as well uh, through reading through forums and reading through kind of troubleshooting errors and stuff. So with that being said, uh, welcome to my elk failure story. So first things first, um, if you're here and you're like, what the hell is elk? I'll tell you what elk is. So in a nutshell, um, elk is uh, three things. Uh, you can ignore this piece here. So elk is uh, ELK, stands for uh, elastic, which is a a, basically a search engine that you can use. Uh, log stash, which is a, basically a way to stash your logs, a place to st stash your logs, like a, it's like a database. And then uh, Kibana is basically a front end uh, UI where you can interact with the logs. So holistically, when you put all these together, you get Elk. And the um, Elk stack specifically is an, an open source, kind of open source, there's some some stuff around that, but semi open source or freely available um, stack of technologies that you can kind of intertwine together. And then once you've intertwined those together, then you can start reading um, different types of logs throughout your network and remote networks and on different machines and all that stuff. And you carry all those logs into a single location and you can start tracking for uh, bad, bad events, doing a lot of cor correlation and uh, detection analytics and alerting and all that stuff. So I have a theoretical idea of what this is. I have a, a, I feel like a decent theoretical understanding of this because I've worked a lot with it and I've had a lot of technical discussions with people on the topic. But that doesn't mean I practically understand how it functions. That same thing applies to many other SIM products, many other EDR products, many other uh, uh, different types of threat intelligence platforms and like all that stuff. I theoretically understand how they all interconnect and their purpose and how they function and maybe even some of the technical aspects of that. But I personally have not set them up myself. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to do this, because I wanted to kind of get practical hands-on experience and also learn through the frustrations that many, many people have had prior to me. Um, and also really to build that muscle of getting through the frustrations, because that's another thing that I've realized with actually doing practical problems, either through coding or data science or um, even system administration and setting up different pieces of infrastructure. There's a lot of troubleshooting that occurs and a lot of um, seemingly frustration in the beginning, you get frustrated, uh, but you start to actually enjoy that process of solving the puzzle. You kind of look forward to finding the error and having to solve it. And that's a muscle that overall I want to build kind of on this entire journey. But I wanted to let you know kind of this is my failure of elk and uh, here we go. So uh, first things first is when working through this process, I felt like this poor girl here. I kept on running into error after error. I couldn't figure anything out. I felt very, very uh, ill-informed and stupid, and I, I just couldn't get to the I couldn't get to the end of the tunnel. So I feel bad for this little girl here. So this is our agenda, and this is what the challenges I faced. Uh, this isn't this is not all of them by any means, but these are a series of high-level kind of challenges that I ran into, and also um, lessons I've taken away from this process that I will apply in the future to other practical problems. Um, but I wanted to kind of share with you uh, things that I ran into, and I hopefully will mitigate your issues. So if you can see some of the lessons that I've learned, you can apply it to your own process if you're setting up elk for the first time and you can hopefully mitigate this slightly. So um, first things first is uh, forest, not trees. So that's the first thing we're going to talk to. And that's really talking about um, zooming out and not zooming too far into the details at first. 
Uh, the next thing is more is better. So this is around a really practical tip of terminals and having different panels open. Another one is uh, trying harder sometimes. And this is really around um, pushing through and trying to, I guess, slam your face against the keyboard until you solve the problem. Um, but that's not always the best solution. Uh, next thing is slow and steady. So at first I tried to basically race through this because I thought it was a very simple thing to do, setting all this stuff up, but I realized quickly that it wasn't. And I needed to reaffirm myself to slow down. And then the last thing is error logs. So error logs have become very, very friendly throughout this entire process. Uh, not at the beginning, but uh, I'd say near the middle and the end. So with that being said, a little bit around the backstory. So like I said, I was um, I wanted to come into this, and my goal here was simply to set up an Elk stack and pull different logs in from different systems. Um, and this is kind of the setup. So I have uh, the Elk stack, and I was doing it on a Windows machine. So Windows was my host. So that's really what everything sits on side of. That is the, the operating system I run today. Some, someday I'll be as cool as the Linux users and hopefully use Linux someday full time. Um, but I'm using Windows now. And I do have a virtual machine via VirtualBox, which I'm sure many of you do as well. And I had a Debian uh, operating system set up there. So those are the two uh, different operating systems I have. So we'll call this our remote machine on our remote network, network, however you want to call it. And my goal here was basically to pump logs from the host machine that I was on and the remote machine, putting into the log stash, uh, running it through a series of things, and then looking at a Kibana. That was my goal. And I thought to myself, it can't be that hard. It's got to be easy, you know? Everybody, everybody I see that does it on YouTube or on a blog or something, they do it in like 30 minutes. So I could probably do it in 30 minutes. But internet, this took me roughly, say, two and a half weeks, uh, maybe two weeks. Yeah, probably two weeks. And that's mainly because I can only do it evenings and weekends because, you know, work, money, got to pay rent and food. Um, but yeah, it was two weeks of evenings and weekends. And uh Learned a lot, but go into this knowing that it's not going to be 30 minutes, at least if you actually want to understand what's happening. So uh, the first thing is the forest, not the trees. And I thought this GIF was perfect because it kind of, it shows you when the bicycle is disassembled completely, it's very overwhelming because there's so many parts and they all interact with so many different pieces. And you're not sure where everything goes. And that's exactly how I felt when I started this. Um, I honestly, I'd say for the first four to three to four days, evenings, I was basically running into a series of problems because I didn't know what piece fit together. I didn't know what did what. And I was trying to just like plug and chug. And I was going from tutorial to tutorial, skipping through tutorials, you know, jumping in the middle to others. I wasn't really backing up and zooming out into the forest. And I was so focused on the trees. So the one thing that I'm kind of hopefully telling you from the lesson that I've learned is when first starting out when incorporating this elk stack and other, you know, harder problems is zoom out and try to actually draw it out. And that's what I did in the end. And I think I actually have a little drawing here. Yeah. I have, a, I have a few little drawings on this little notepad here of me trying to figure out how to map everything together. And I actually have a, a series of animations here to kind of walk you through my process and kind of show you how I approach this in a simplistic way, starting with very, very small bits, very, very small, tiny problems. And I'll talk to that in a, a future um, kind of point on here. And then I grew it out further. So my iterations were this. I started out with Elastic and Kamana. I didn't want it to do with anything else because that was too much. Um, so with Elastic and Kamana, I just wanted to get them set up and get them running. My goal was basically just to see Kibana. I wanted to make sure the Elastic search worked and Kibana was connected correctly and I could see the dashboard. That was my goal. That was not easy. That took me a little while to actually get running. So the next goal was to say, okay, now I have this. Now let's actually get some information in there. And actually, before I jump into this, luckily, when you run Elastic and Gabbana, um, for some reason, I'm not really sure why this is the case, but there's this thing called Metric Beat. So we'll, we'll say M Beat. Now, Metric Beat actually, I think, comes kind of prepackaged into Elastic and Gabbana when you turn them on. So you actually have some sort of data that's running into Gabbana. So that was kind of a win and a personal excitement that I had some data. Um, so the next thing was actually getting data in that was data that I wanted to see, which is logs. So you can see here, um, I have this little logo, which is event viewer inside of Microsoft and inside of event viewer, I had Sysmon and I had to basically figure out not just what Sysmon I wanted to get, but I also had to figure out different types of, um, I think there's a GitHub out there that I'm sure many of you know about that actually, uh, has a series of, I think parsing mechanisms or filters that actually filter out Sysmon to actually useful events. So I included that um, filter on top of my Sysmon inside of Event Viewer. So when I was pumping that into Elastic, I was getting in data that was interesting for from a security lens. 
So I had to figure all that out and pump that in. So that was the second step. So we had got elastic and Kanbana, elastic and Kanbana working first. And then we got beats working, which is basically uh, a beat is something that sits with on your machine. And it's a, it's a lightweight agent that pushes out logs um, to either Elastic or Logstash. So you can, simpli you can simplistic simplistically see it as if you have a series of machines here. And all these machines are pushing out beats. So these will have beats that sit on top of them. And those beats can be different types of things. So it can be metric beat, uh, wing log beat, file beat heartbeat, all that stuff. And they're sending off all these logs to either Logstash or Elk. And then all of that is then presented on Kibana. So you can see here that we have um, beats and that's what, that's correlating to the Microsoft user that I was using on my host machine. So once I've done that, the next thing was actually just to get the virtual box set up. So I wanted to get the virtual box set up and have the syslog uh, logs being pumped out of a beat that I had on here as well. So I had a beat on my virtual machine and a beat on, uh, this had a file beat and this had a win log beat, two different types of beats that I learned about. So once I got those set up, then I got those pushed out to Elasticsearch. So that was kind of a huge win for me as well. Um, partly due to the fact that um, when doing the initial setup for your host machine, you can do a lot of simple steps, which, which is what a lot of tutorials will show you. So in a blog or a YouTube channel, they'll tend to say, just use localhost. You know, they'll say localhost everything and it'll all work for you. Or they'll say use 0.0.0, .0, which, you know, probably isn't the best hygiene for security. And they say, use these items and then everything will connect correctly here and here and here. Now, when doing that, that works. But when you do a virtual machine, it's kind of remote in the sense that you would want not just localhost, but actually to pin to a specific um, IP address within your network, which is your home network. So this is actually when I got into understanding how which which machine uh, did what, who was connected to who, what ports were being used, and what IP addresses are being used. So that's another thing. So I had to basically figure out, okay, so um, what what ports here? So we have we'll, we'll just do port here, and then we'll do IP here. So I needed to know what port was being used, what IP was being used for this host machine that was hosting Elasticsearch, and then I needed to basically configure that inside of this beat here to ensure that when it was pushing out, it was pushing out to the right location and it was being consumed by the right place. And then the same thing applies for this one as well. Since I've adjusted this, this has a new IP and it's not just localhost or 0.0.0. .0. So I needed to do the same config here to push it out here as well. So you can see that once you start actually not just doing everything locally and you start trying to say, if you're in a theoretical network, it starts to get a little more difficult. So you have to figure out all these different kind of uh, tiny uh, minutia. So once we have uh, this set up, the next thing was actually to get Logstash involved. Now, this is really where things got complicated and I really struggled. Um, so all this stuff up to this point, the next, like the first three steps or so, took me about four or five days. And remember I said it was like two, two and a half weeks. So this next thing was actually saying, okay, I'm gonna remove Debian and I'm gonna remove the syslogs and I'm gonna simplify what I'm pushing in and I wanna focus on just getting, I just wanna, I just wanna get my win log beats and I want them to go to log stash instead of skipping log stash and going here. So I just wanted to go into log stash. And then I wanted log stash to then push that to Elasticsearch, which would then be queried through Kibana. Now, the issue here was many, many, many issues. Um, and I partly because I was just going too fast. But anyways, um, this, this is what I was trying to achieve. This took a while to figure out because there's a lot of configurations here and there's a lot of things that needed to adjust. Um, so that was quite difficult. And once I set that up and that all finally worked, which took probably like three days, I then incorporated a syslog, which was actually not too difficult because I finally figured out what the issue was, what I was doing. And mainly, um, one thing you can take away from this experience that I would wish I knew prior is that there's very minimal changes that need to happen here outside of filters because filters are basically a way to, um, a way to parse these logs that are coming through to make them more presentable and also more useful when you actually um, you know, query inside of Elastic through Kibana. Now, outside of this and maybe a, a few other minor configurations, a lot of your changes and a lot of your focus area needs to be on the file beat and also the win log beat. And those configurations are needed would need to be what's changed, not changing here, because that was my issue when I initially started. I was playing around a lot with the log stash configuration YAML file and all the stuff that comes with it, but I wasn't really focusing on the beats, and that's what really hung me up for a while. But in the end, I, uh, I got all this set up, which was nice, and 
this is kind of what it looks like um, at a high level. So here we can say we have our Debian server and then we have our, so let's do it in the, in the black here. So we have our win log win for W and then we'll do D for Debian here. And then this is obviously not something that we used. Um, but like I said, we're shipping these logs into Logstash. And then once we've shipped it into Logstash, Logstash then does some parsing and filtering, as I mentioned, through some of the filters here. And I use specifically Grok filters, which was a kind of a basic way to do it. And then once you've done that, then you're sitting in Elasticsearch, and then Elasticsearch then is queried by Kibana. And then that leads you down a whole rabbit hole of basically different types of uh, languages that you can query with, because I think there's... Um, one from Endgame that was quite useful and also the Kibana query language. So that is a path that I've not dove down completely, which will be another project in another series some down the, someday in the future. So the next thing is more is better. So more is better is a very quick practical tip. When doing this, I actually found that utilizing uh, the Windows PowerShell um, specifically and utilizing these different tabs and coloring them separately to actually know specifically what's doing what and the reason being is that when I initially did this without actually having separate tabs, or at least, um, I guess, consciously having separate tabs for a specific purpose, actually is what slowed me down as well. Because I really could, I didn't know what tab was doing what. I didn't know, I didn't really remember what like terminal was doing what, and I didn't know which logs to look at and errors, etc. So having it segregated out, saying, okay, this tab here is dedicated to Elastic. And when it's running, it's running. I can go back there and check if it's failed. Same for Kibana, same for Logstash, log stash, and same for WinLogBeat. And you can see here we're sitting in the WinLogBeat based off of the, the path that we're in. So that was another lesson, you know, make it, make it separated. And here's my poor little beaver man. I think it's a beaver. I don't know, maybe like a dog beaver. Next one, try harder. So this is an interesting lesson that I learned. So when first diving into the project, uh, I was very focused on the details. I was trying to get, I was trying to get, first off, I was trying to go fast, but I was also trying to basically uh, understand all the, the nitty gritty details, how everything connected. And I didn't really zoom out similar to the forest concept. And actually the focused and diffuse modes of thinking are something that's been taught in some sort of lecture I watched many years ago. Um, which is actually quite useful when you're, you're faced with a problem, especially an overwhelming problem. And you sometimes get overwhelmed with either errors or not understanding a concept, and you're stuck in this focused mode of thinking, trying to always push through that problem, and you're trying harder and harder and harder. But in reality, when you do that try harder concept, it, it most, most of the time doesn't work out. So I, I realized after you know probably five or six days of me being frustrated, I took a step back, I kind of calmed myself down, and what I did actually is I, instead of trying to solve a specific problem or trying to understand why a specific error was occurring, I took a step back and I started um, consuming broad tutorials on the topic of elk, trying to understand kind of like the topology of the terminology, how it's discussed, how things are connected and getting different perspectives on how people teach it. And by doing that, I started gathering more and more terminology and definitions and things I didn't know about when it comes to like certain uh, syntax and, and things that should be configured and not configured, etc. And I had no specific goal in mind of solving a problem. I just wanted to consume elk knowledge or elk information. And by doing that, it kind of helped me have a better framework of approaching the problem I was, de I was dealing with through the entire time. So if you're ever stuck with this issue or whatever the issue is, take a step back and consume widely in that topic and then, you know, go back into it. So that was useful for me. Um, this video here on YouTube was actually quite useful as well. It just came out like a few weeks ago when I was you know, obviously publishing this. And it talks through how to think like a programmer. And it's, it really, it's focused on breaking problems down. So it's not just programmers, but scientific thinking and things like that. So that was also a good reminder during this phase of frustration. And this is actually something I wanted to point out that I previously pointed out slightly in the, in the first uh, agenda item, which was agenda item, what is this? It's YouTube, not business. So um, the first thing I talked about as forest, not trees, um, was breaking the problem down. And specifically here, uh, like I said, when I broke down the problem, not focusing on the whole entire you know, beast of that is elk, but actually breaking it down one step at a time and saying, okay, first I'm gonna do um, just EK. So I'm just gonna set up Elastic and Kibana and I'm gonna get that to work. Once that's done, you know, great. Next, I'm gonna basically try to send some logs into EK. So that was the next step. And then once I got that, that's good. And then the next thing I was gonna include the L inside of my EK, right? 
And then you kind of get the idea, right? We're walking step by step, working our way through the different pieces and we're breaking the problem down into smaller chunks. So, you know, one chunk is saying set up uh, elastic and Kibana. And inside of that, there could be an, even a smaller chunk and saying, okay, set up elastic, how does that work? And then, then an even smaller one is how to configure elastic. So it's really breaking that problem down into a small pyramid and then working your way back up to actually, you know, consume the elephant that is the problem you're trying to solve. So the next thing is slow and steady. Um, so when I first said I, when I first started this, I was just like, uh, you know, good old Jim Carrey here, uh, really trying to solve it quickly because I felt that it was an easy thing to do. I thought, oh, this is something I should easily be able to do. It's like, you know, setting up Elk is simple and, you know, it, everybody has done it. So I should be able to do it in like, you know, a day, maybe even less. And I realized quickly that was not the case. Um, and that was, that took me a while. I'd say like six or seven days. So I think the important thing here is a quote that's, I don't know if it's Wyatt or Alvin, it, you know, there's a, there's an argument on who created this quote or who started this quote, but the quote in itself is a good thing to kind of remember, at least in this situation for me, which is, um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast, which basically means, um, slow down and move steadily and not rush through things. Because if you rush through things like good old Jim here, then there's a good chance that you're going to have a series of errors and things aren't going to work out the way you expected. You're going to get frustrated and either give up or it'll take a lot longer than it should. So this took me a while to actually come to this kind of idea of slowing down and calming down and not rushing. But once I got to that point, it was, uh, it was a good breath of fresh air. So slow and steady and, uh, you know, be smooth like water. Last thing, air logs. So air logs are annoying, but they are your best friend. And this is something that I realized probably halfway through. Um, a lot of the kind of the epiphanies came halfway through. And when first seeing air logs, I was just copying and pasting the air logs into Google and, and quickly looking through the answers, not slowing down. That was another thing is when I was trying to find the answer, I was trying to quickly just find out oh, like, what's the one syntax mess up that I can quickly find and fix. And I was rushing through reading the error logs and rushing, trying to find the answers. And that prolonged my process of actually getting to the answer. Instead of stopping methodically reading the error, understanding what each piece of the error means and then breaking it down. So that's one thing that I wish I would have done as well is slowed down with the errors. But now that I've gotten to the process, I did slow down and that's why I was able to complete this whole entire project. Um, the next piece here is an important piece, and this is just one configuration file from uh, Logstash, but the same thing applies to Elastic and all the other pieces of the Elk stack, is there's different ways to actually um, log the information out of the process that's occurring within Logstash. And I highly recommend um, that if you're getting errors or the machine is not acting the way you think it should and it's not mimicking the tutorial that you're following, I highly recommend you switching on the debug, uh, the debug logs. So you would basically swap out info here for, uh, for, you know, debug, swap that out there. And then that's going to actually give you a lot more information back when the machine's running and it'll give you a better understanding of what errors are occurring. And then also gives you more stuff to read through and understand and also, um, search on in Google to get your answer. So debug mode you should totally do that. Um, the next thing is actually when, moving through this, I highly recommend not just reading it inside of the terminal, because sometimes when you have a bunch of logs going through the terminal, you'll just read it there. And maybe, maybe you can, if there's like a simple uh, error that you can quickly solve. But I realized that probably 50% of the time the errors were really smashed together and unreadable. So I pulled those out or at least looked at them through um, a different IDE. So, you know, if you have sublime use that, if you have VS code, use that. If you're really super cool and you know how to use Vim um, and, people like me envy you because I don't have the, it's none of my priority list yet to do that, but I'm sure it will be soon to be really good at Vim. But if you have any of these, have some sort of syntax highlighting, breaking up the log in a way that it's color coded so it's easier for you to read, I highly recommend that so you can actually understand what's being discussed and you can find the answer faster, at least understand the problem faster. Um, another thing is a very simple, small, practical thing, but when doing this, I highly recommend if you're doing anything with beats. So here we have file beat, but this could be win log beat. This could be metric beat. This could be heartbeat, whatever beat it is. Um, I highly recommend doing tests prior to actually pumping that data out to Elasticsearch or Logstash to then be, um, queried on and uh, alerted on through Kibana. And reason being is I made this mistake 
many, many times. And I finally came to the solution of, you know, running these tests prior to actually connecting things and trying to get it to all work. Um, because by doing this, you can actually solve the problem a lot faster if the problem resides inside the beat that you're, you know, playing around with. So I highly recommend to do this in this order, right? So one, two. One is to test the configuration. So this is the, this is the syntax. So when it'd be win log beat here, win log beat test config. And then if it's good, it's gonna come out as okay. If it's bad, then it comes out with an error. And the next thing is actually doing the output test. And this is basically testing the connection between your beat and either log stash or elk. So this is gonna come out of here and say, okay, is it connected? It'll show out some kind of items of what port, what IP, um, if it's TLS encrypted, all that stuff. So I highly recommend you do both of these because if this comes out okay and this comes out okay and all the information is green and everybody's happy, there's a good chance that your file beat's okay or your beat itself is okay. The error lies somewhere else. So it's basically reverse engineering and troubleshooting. This is something that I'm sure many of you understand, but for some of us, some of us, um, this is a practice that I need to get better at and it's these kind of lessons learned that helped. So that was that item and those were all the lessons learned and here's some resources I wanted to point out that I found very useful. Um, so first things first, uh, John Hubbard has done an amazing job in this lecture here where honestly I think out of all of the things that I've read and um, watched and listened to, which is a lot in the last two and a half weeks, I highly recommend you actually watching this video. Um, I would probably watch this after watching or reading probably five to six pieces of content, high level content associated with elk. So like what is elk, what are the pieces, how they interact at a very high level. And then once you've gotten the understanding at a higher level, highly recommend you watching this, uh, this lecture here on YouTube um, to understand more of the deeper concepts and the makeup of what elk is and how it's utilized, especially within security. So that's a good one. Um, another one here is actually logs.il. They have a ton of really good blogs and those blogs, um, they're holistic and they're kind of some, some of them are slightly outdated, but they're still holistic and they're quite lengthy and they talk you through a lot of content. So that's very, very useful. And the last one is actually um, Elastic, their website. So the Elastic search engine uh, for Elk, they actually have a lot of really good documentation walking you through how to set certain things up. There are certain items that are kind of briefly skipped over, or at least I didn't understand them thoroughly enough, so I had to dig a lot deeper into some pieces. Um, but they do have really good documentation that actually helps you set up a lot of stuff. And if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have actually completed any of this because to be honest, some of the YouTube video, most of the YouTube videos um, weren't as useful as I hoped they would be. Um, so those are my resources. Uh, that is the lessons learned and internet. I hope that this is useful for those of you that aren't looking just for a tutorial, but are looking for people that have failed at this process and finally succeeded and some of the lessons they learned. So with that being said, internet, I will see you next time.